Procedural generation can be very pleasing to think of and prototype, but can also be very daunting to implement and especially polish. Depending on your levels, procedural generation can bring a lot of variety and replayability to your game, but can also exponentially grow the complexity of your level design processes and systems. In this devlog, we will discuss the procedural generation in the scope of my game, Warden's Will. Starting with the design of the dungeon levels, we will talk about the different solutions I experimented with, how I streamlined my processes to be able to work efficiently with procedural generation, and we will finish with some tips and tricks that might help you get more out of your procedurally generated levels. And speaking of tips and tricks, you know how a lot of aspiring game devs when designing their first game want to make an MMORPG? This has always been a mistake, and any experienced game developer would tell you to go much much smaller when starting, because making games requires a lot of skills, assets, and a lot of non-game dev related things like publishing, marketing, and monetization. Well, I am happy to say that we live in a world where making an MMORPG as a first and even a solo project is not a crazy idea anymore, and that is possible thanks to today's video sponsor, Core. Core is a new, fully featured, do-it-all gaming platform where you can create, publish, monetize and play games all in one place. And all for free. God, I wish I had that when I started making games. It is absurdly easy to use and has almost no learning curve since no coding is required. It is based on Unreal Engine which makes it insanely powerful with high quality AAA graphics and they did a great job of abstracting most of Unreal's complexity to make it basically the easiest game creation platform I've ever used and I've used a lot of them. Seriously, I just launched Core and after like two minutes I was... What? Enjoying a Deadmau5 concert? That thing is fucking awesome by the way. Core offers thousands of free music, sound and art assets you can use in your own games. There are many advanced templates you can start from with a lot of functionality and online multiplayer is natively baked in all of them. If you do know how to code, however, you can create your own game logic in Lua. Once you make your game, you can monetize it and publish it for free directly on the platform. And the 50% revenue share is pretty much the best you'll get in the industry as of today. With the help of the Perks program, some core creators have been able to pay their bills, buy their dream cars and quit their day jobs. We are starting to see success stories pop up for this platform and I do expect to see more and more of them in the future. Long story short. Core is hands down the easiest way to get into game development today, so click the link in the description, download Core for free, play some games, and start creating your own game. Let me know if you would like to see some more Core content on this channel in the comment section and by smashing that like button and I might just do some Core specific videos in the future. But for now, let's get back to making games the fucking hard way. Level design is a very time consuming part of game creation and this is especially true if you do not have a good enough level design experience and knowledge. You can end up remaking levels and changing them which can blow up the work hours required to get to good enough results. With this in mind, procedural generation can prove to be very good level design exercise because it forces you to think about the structure of your game levels, it actually can be a good help figuring out the flow of your game without the need to completely rework your maps every time the structure of your level changes. Even though I love the idea of immense maze-like dungeons, those can be very hard to populate, decorate and get to a point where they do not feel repetitive, which basically goes against the concept of procedural generation, whose main goal is to provide diversity and replayability to the player. For this reason, I decided to keep my dungeons of reasonable size. This way, I can really work on the identity of each dungeon and have them be different from one another. During the course of the game, the player will be traveling from one dungeon to the other, not needing to stay too long in one single dungeon and trying to accomplish the necessary actions to get to the final dungeon and boss. However, because of the roguelike nature of the game and permadeath, upon losing in one of the dungeons, the player will embody a new warden and restart the sequence from the beginning. This is where procedural generation kicks in. The dungeons, even though having the same themes, will be different and offer a fresh challenge to the player. The player, while getting better at the game and learning the enemy's behaviors and the dungeon properties, will be kept challenged thanks to the changes brought to the dungeon layout, the enemy spawns and group configurations. But even though the dungeons are concise enough to not feel samey and repetitive to the player, the different successive dungeons need to have some unique properties from one to the other in order to keep the player engaged when transitioning from one level to the next. This is mainly achieved through unique dungeon gameplays. 
while dungeons share a considerable part of the gameplay like combat, locked doors, hidden doors, treasure rooms, etc., they also each feature some systems to differentiate them. These can range from special puzzles linked to the dungeon themes to a completely unique system that governs the entirety of the dungeon and changes the base combat focused gameplay to something more exotic. Not only are these different dungeon gameplays important to keep the player engaged and challenged, they are also a necessary way to convey different feelings and emotions throughout the game. While a combat dungeon can give the player the feeling of power by taking down hordes of enemies and looting more and more powerful items, another dungeon can disempower the player and make him feel vulnerable with a particularly menacing enemy that is hard or near impossible to beat and needs to be avoided at all costs. I do not want to spoil the different dungeon types I have designed for Warden's Will. I can however tell you about one unique system that really makes a difference and gets the game closer to the success and finish line, and that is the Steam Wishlist system. Steam does give a lot of importance to the number of wishlists an upcoming game has, and that can really be the tipping point for an indie game to turn into a commercially successful project. So please take a moment to click the link in the description and hit that wishlist button so hard that Steam sends me an email saying to go easy on them. In the past procedural generation devlog, we have talked about the plugin we used, Dungeon Architect, and the different ways you can generate levels with it. The first one being level-based generation and the second one being tile-based generation. With the first method, you need to create your own level modules with their connection points and have a procedural generation algorithm spawn them, position them and link them together. This is a great procedural generation method for when you want to keep control over your levels and level design. It allows you to have authored content and have it placed and arranged procedurally. This is the perfect method for when you want very specific chunks or levels for storytelling, specific puzzles, or just beautifully decorated and lit levels. The downside of this method is that you do have to design your levels by hand and have to design a lot of them to avoid repetition. This is the method I'm using for some specific parts of the game that do not require much variety and where I want the experience to be completely controlled. The second method, the tile-based generation as its name suggests, is tile-based, which means that your levels will be generated tile by tile. Depending on your configuration, a tile can be a ground tile, a wall tile, a door tile, etc. There are different tile-based builders in Dungeon Architect, but for our case, we are going to use the grid flow builder. There are mainly two files that make up a grid flow dungeon. The first one is the flow graph. In this file, you define your dungeon flow. You create your different paths through the dungeon, the main and alternate paths, you specify the locked doors positions and where to find their corresponding keys. You spawn your gameplay actors and items like enemies, treasures, bosses, and finally, you can spawn some overlay markers for decoration, vegetation, foliage, etc. The flow graph also allows for the configuration of things like room sizes, cave structures, dungeon outskirts, and more. It is a very powerful tool and does a lot for the diversification of dungeons in terms of actual level construction, but also in terms of dungeon gameplay. The specific dungeon gameplays mentioned in the design part will mainly be done here in addition to the level blueprints. The flow graph works in conjunction with the second necessary file, the theme. In this file you specify what every marker in your dungeon corresponds to. You start by configuring your base tile markers like grounds, walls, floors, and then you can configure your custom markers for gameplay, decoration, and overlays. The theme file is one of the main pillars of Dungeon Architect and offers a lot of functionality and control over the selection, spawning, and positioning of your meshes and actors. Using selection, spawn, and transform logics, you can really introduce custom logic in your theme file to really suit your vision. This is a great way of managing the different assets and models that your dungeon will use for its generation, but can also very quickly get out of hand if your dungeons are a bit complex and require a big number of items. To reduce the overhead complexity for such dungeons, one can use blueprints to group different assets and spawn them as one single asset, or configure multiple assets and spawn one of them randomly or based on some setting. One plugin that I found very useful for this is Prefabricator. This is a plugin made by the same creator of Dungeon Architect and is pretty much the perfect companion to Dungeon Architect. It basically does exactly what I just described. It allows for the grouping of multiple assets as one single prefab that can be placed in the world. It also allows for the creation of what is called prefab collections. This is an asset that references multiple prefab actors and can be placed in the world and then be randomized to actually spawn one of the prefabs it references. With these features, the theme file can be kept reasonably simple since things like decorations, foliage and overlay randomizations can be handled directly by Prefabricator. You can then focus the theme file on the necessary parts of the dungeon to really get a polished base structure. So with this plugin combination, 
I set up to create different dungeons with different flow graphs and different location themes. In Warden's Well, the dungeon's succession represents the path to go deeper and deeper into the Cursed Mountain. So the dungeon themes need to be representative of this. The player starts with kind of realistic, human-like dungeons, and the further he gets, the more exotic and fantastical the dungeons will look. This is supposed to represent the power of the Dark Force and its ability to corrupt the environment and the creatures around it. So the closer you get to it, the more apparent and obvious it will become. And if you dive deep enough into the mountain, you will find something really special. It is very easy to see, but not everybody will notice it. However, those who do will make the difference. And that is the like button. So if you are enjoying this dev vlog, please take the time to show it to me and to the YouTube algorithm. It does help the channel immensely and motivates me to make more content like this. Working with procedural generation can be intimidating, but also very satisfying. It does feel amazing when you first see your dungeons being generated, but can also feel overwhelming when you encounter issues that don't seem to have any solutions. So here are some tips and tricks that I figure out during my experimentations and that can help you avoid or solve some problems you might encounter during your adventure. First, let's talk about lighting. Generating a tile-based dungeon means you also have to generate the lighting for that dungeon. And as we know, lighting can be pretty performance heavy and can really tank your game's performance if done wrong. My tips for lighting a procedural dungeon is to first try to not light your dungeon. Sometimes just having a post-process material that kind of bypasses lighting can be a great way to avoid the need for light, but this is something that won't work for all games and will greatly depend on your art style and direction. If you do need to have lights, there are a couple things you can try. You can for example have a dynamic light directly attached to your character that moves with him and that lights the environment around the player. This is perfect for top-down games or games that aren't reliant on good-looking graphics and environments too much. If for your game, like mine, one light isn't sufficient to really light your dungeon and make it look good, you can try these following tips. First, you can procedurally place lights in your dungeon but disable and enable them based on your player position. This way, you do not have tens of dynamic point lights affecting the world at the same time. And second, and this is mainly a looking good hack, you can use fake lights for things like torches, chandeliers and fires. This will help with realism and immersion without affecting your performance since these aren't real lights. They are basic blueprints that simulate lights but to the untrained player eye can have the same effect. I use the utility from the marketplace called modulated lighting for this but there are other ones available. And last let's talk about variety. It is very important to have a good enough asset and item variety in your dungeons to avoid repetition. And aside from plugins that can help you with that like prefabricator, one very easy way to do this is to use symmetry. You can specify two entries for each object and have one entry be scaled to minus one on the Y axis. This gives you two possible objects for any of your assets, which can help you get some variety without the need for additional models. Procedural generation is a very complex and broad subject and I will most certainly make a third video about this for my game. But this is all we have time for today. In the next dev vlog, we'll be exploring one of the most important parts of a roguelike and one of the most interesting parts of procedural generation, and that is the loot. We will take a look at how I created my loot system with configurable loot components, different great chests and other pickup interactables. We will discuss how to make the looting experience satisfying for the players through animation and visual and sound effects. And we will talk about balance and how to not only balance your loot and items, but also streamline the process by externalizing loot items and stat files. So that's it guys for this dev vlog. Don't forget to check out Core, it's completely free and you will not regret discovering it. The link is in the description. A huge thank you to the Manticore team for supporting the channel and sponsoring this video. Also, while you're there, hit that like button and if it's not yet the case, consider subscribing. It's also free and you can change your mind. And as always, my name is Enes. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video.